I want to go in that class. <laughs> no, you don't. Let me just say one thing. I love being a pastor. And I'm telling you the place I'm at right now, they asked the CEO this question. He just got the job of being CEO, CEO of a major corporation. And he also at the same time was, you don't try out, what do you do? Audition, it's not an audition. To be a pastor of a church. What's the right word? Well, it wasn't an interview because he was preaching. So it's a tryout. I'll think of the word. <laughs> he was looking to get, get the position as pastor, and I asked him the question in the interview, how are you going to pastor the church if you're the CEO of the company? And what they were asking, basically, how are you going to visit everybody in the hospital? How are you going to answer everybody's phone call? How are you going to mow the lawn? How are you going to paint the church? And the answer is, you can't. And his response was, I'm going to pastor the church because my job as pastor, after my job as CEO of the other company, is to pray, read the word, preach, and mentor people. So if that's your job description, you can do it. So I am walking in the job description that is for my job, which is as a pastor, and I'm telling you, the best way I could describe it, I don't know if you saw the movie Bruce Almighty, when, when Morgan Freeman gave him his powers, and, and he was all of a sudden he wakes up and he hears a million voices in his head and he's trying to answer all those prayers. Well, the reason he couldn't do it is because he wasn't God. And the reason why I can't do it is because I'm not God. But I would wake up with those voices in my head. And, and most of those voices had to do with the trees being cut down, the building being painted, the air conditioner not being on cool enough in the summer, and, and, and just wondering why these things can't be fixed. And, 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 you know, Tony said once in a while, the problem is you know how to fix some of these things, so you're always busy. So what had happened was I had to get to the point where I said, you know what, I don't care. And we have to make sure that you understand what I mean by that. I do care about you, but if it's hot in here, someone else is going to have to figure out how to fix the air conditioner because I'm not doing it. I'll sweat, I'll preach, I don't care, but my focus, if all the lights go out, I'll preach in the dark. You know, so I, I'm doing my job. And when you're doing your job, you're going to be peaceful and happy. So I'm experiencing this, and it's just last night, I got to spend some time with the Lord. And I'm telling you, when I'm preparing a message, and I'm getting excited, and I'm starting to say amen to the things I'm hearing from the Lord, I'm like, that is good. I've read that scripture so many times, I never saw that stuff. So when I'm getting that kind of revelation you're going to be blessed. I want to start out today just reminding you of what my mission is, the call on my life and what we're here to do. The Lord told me to prepare the way of the Lord. Told my wife, I read it in Isaiah, she read it in Luke before we, we were even together. And when she said, you know, I was reading the scripture, I believe... And this is before we were dating, you know, this is what God has for me to do. What do you think it means? I said, I think it means we're supposed to get married. I mean, that's, that's, that's she's the one. I mean, that's it. We're, we're call is identical. So, what does that mean? One of the things Jesus said when he came back, you know, don't you love when preachers ask questions that have a million answers? But if I was to ask you the question, what do you think Jesus would be looking for when he came back? What would your answers be? Wow, a couple of people went right to the scripture, great. But there's, he wants to see people living right, or, you know, you can take the parable of the five virgins, the five foolish virgins, and you could say he's looking for people who are looking for him. But really what it says is he's looking for faith. And what does faith do? It pleases the Lord. Without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. That is in Luke 18.8, 8, by the way, where it says, when the Son of Man returns... He's looking to find faith on the earth. What he's looking for is to find a victorious church, because that's what faith does. He's looking for people who've learned to walk in the blessings that he provided from salvation, healing, prosperity, everything he provided. He's coming, coming back for a church that knows their authority over the devil, that are standing victorious. That's what he's coming back, and that's my job to help you be that church. So what I'm going to share today is, is 
try to explain to you some of my frustration. My frustration in my personal life and as a pastor is the gap between what I see in the Word and what we're experiencing. What I saw the early church doing and what we're doing. What I saw Peter doing when he walked on water, when I watched the disciples and he said to him, you should be rebuking the wind and waves. Why would you wake me up? You should just did it yourself, is basically what he said. When I'm looking at where the church is and what we're experiencing, how much power is actually being released in our life to change our worlds, our lives, as well as the people around us, that gap bothers me tremendously. My frustration is multiplied as I'm realizing I'm reaping what I sowed and what I am sowing because my wife and I have what I am reaping because what my wife and I had sown over the years is I am reaping as a leader, as a pastor faithful people. I'm reaping people who who love God. You know, remember Moses said you're causing me to lead a stiff-necked people. They're rebellious. They don't do anything right. I walk away for five minutes. I come back and they're making idols. He said, Lord, if you're going to make me lead these people, just kill me now. <laughs> now, if I was leading those kind of people, there would be that kind of frustration. But that's not why my frustration is, is multiplied. It's because there's faithful people. They love God with all their heart. They love their pastors. They serve tirelessly. They do it with a great attitude. The love you have for one another is absolutely, I don't see it anywhere else. So with all this in place, the gap frustrates me all the more. With, with people living like that for the Lord, we should not see the gap from what the Word says we should have and how we should be living compared to what we're experiencing. If you're a parent, and there's a lack of money and you have to do without, it bothers you a little bit but not too much. But when your lack of money or if you're out of work starts to affect your children, that's when it really bothers you. So as the daddy of this church, when I see people walking in lack and not experiencing the power and everything that's available, that causes my frustration to multiply. So what I'm going to try to do and, and let me just add this before I go. First of all, God's not mad at you. I'm not mad at you. God is pleased and I'm pleased at the progress we've made and, and your efforts. It's incredible. I'm not unsatisfied with you. It's, it's the gap I'm unsatisfied with. And I, I do want to apologize that if at any point I made you feel like you were the source of my frustration, I want to apologize. But it's this trying to fight for my kids. This, this gap thing is bothering me. So I'm going to share some things today that I hope this is, this is what we have to get in mind. We're believing for this gap to be shut. And we're waiting patiently for it to be shut, but we're not giving up. So I want to give some things that may encourage you or help you to deal with or, or process this and go forward to make sure that we, we're, we're not giving up on what the Word says. You know, when some people see the gap from what the Word says and what they are experiencing, they, they rewrite the Bible. Well, the Bible don't really mean that, because if it really meant that, if it was God's will, we would be seeing it. And, and, and they rewrite things, and they make doctrines up to make sense of why there, there's a gap. Well, I don't have to have an answer for you. I do have an answer for you, and it's, I don't know, which is my frustration. When I see people living holy for the Lord, loving one another, willing to serve, serving with a good attitude, there should not be a gap. And I'm not going to make an excuse for that gap. I'm going to just keep doing what I'm supposed to do. And we're going to start with this one in Galatians 6, 9. You can go ahead and turn there or put it up on the screen. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season you will reap if you do not lose heart. That's the title of my message today. Do not lose heart. Don't lose heart. It says you will reap, and it also says don't grow weary in well-doing. 
The purpose of Satan's attacks on us is to cause us to grow weary so we stop doing what we know we're supposed to do. We stop laying hands on the sick because we grow weary in saying they're not getting healed. Well, the Bible commands those who believe to lay hands on the sick. So you don't grow weary in laying hands on the sick. It's not your job to heal them. It's your job to lay hands on the sick. So we do that as believers. In Proverbs 13, 12, it says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. When somebody has a dream or a hope, whether it's something personally or things that you might want to see, um, if you're sick and you need to be healed, or if somebody in your family's sick and you're praying for them, the Bible says the longer you're holding on to that hope and don't see an answer, the Bible says it, it, it makes the heart sick. But when the dream fulfill, is fulfilled, it's a tree of life. So again, my frustration is from the hope being deferred in the tree of life. So we're trying to narrow that gap. And one of the problems people have when, when life's not quite going the way they should, the tendency is to withdraw. That is the purpose of behind these attacks of our enemy to cause you to get up on a Sunday morning. How many people must have done that today since we're looking out and saying, I'm, I'm just tired. I, I need a break. Well, listen, if, if not grown weary and well-doing, we have to get to the next scripture in Hebrews 10.25. It says, let us not neglect the meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So number one, you should come to church expecting encouragement. And number two, if you don't need encouragement, that means you should be at a place in your life where you're coming to church to encourage people. One or the other, but... The answer is not staying home. In every situation, you should be in fellowship. When you start to understand, and we were, I'll get into it a little later, and Jacqueline kind of mentioned it, the importance of that seed being sown and watered, and not growing weary in well-doing, which is coming to hear the Word, and, and always, always being excited about the Word, always reminding yourself the word is being preached, whether I feel like it or not, faith is growing because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. So you come to church knowing my faith's going to grow when I get there. So not neglect the, neglect the gathering of yourself together. In 1 Thessalonians 2.18 it says this. Paul was speaking. He said, therefore we wanted to come to you. Even I, Paul... Time and again, but Satan hindered us. But Satan hindered us. There's people home today from church because Satan hindered them. There's people not moving ahead in life financially because Satan hindered them. I thank God, you know, when, when people in church succeed and, and take a step of faith, I, I see Pedro started his own business and went out and took a step of faith and went to Florida, had a truck made, it's beautiful, and he just took a step of faith and saying, I'm doing this. Amen. You know how many people are hindered from doing things like that? Because Satan, I'm sure he had a lot of obstacles to stop him. But he wouldn't take no for an answer. You know, there's times... As we look at the scripture and we're talking about the gap, one of the main reasons for the gap is our enemy. His, his methods. The Bible says beware of the schemes of our enemy. The things that he's doing to cause that gap in our lives from what the word says and what we should experience. Sometimes we, we need to know what to do. You know, in football, the defense are like demons. Those who play defense, really that's what your job is. Let's stop progress. Let's hinder their progress. And if you're running the ball up the middle every play and you can't gain a yard, there's one of two things you have to do. In that point in your life, if you're doing what you believe God told you to do, well then just keep running it. And keep rebuking the devil and keep going. But there's times in our life, with the wisdom of God... We keep running up the middle and God's, you need to go back to the huddle and regroup. 
and say, well, if we can't make a yard up the middle and they're clogging them, let's go around them. Sometimes God has a plan that you're not taking time to listen to. And you keep trying to run the same old plays. If you're in a neighborhood and you're trying to reach a neighborhood with a plan that the guy in another state used to reach his neighborhood and it's not working, you may need a different plan to reach your neighborhood. So it's time, there's times you have to come back and regroup. It's kind of what we did here. I had to step back and look at what was going on. And, and let me tell you, when you do it, God always answers you. My job description being cleared up was one of the major things that God changed. We're, we're raising people up. I'm not trying to do the, lo the job alone anymore. And one of the things I've asked for people to consider uh, a monthly offering above and beyond your, your Sunday morning offering to help us pay some of the salaries that we need to move forward. I'm asking you to pray and ask the Lord what, what he might want you to do with that. So we go to the second area of what we need to do and, 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 and to kind of shed light on what the devil's doing to, of stopping us going forward, what we need to go forward. And this, point number two is stay focused. I'm going to read a portion of scripture that you've probably read before, you've probably heard before. It's a little lengthy, but I'm going to ask you not to do, and I know you do this. How do I know you do this? Because occasionally I'm sitting in the audience. And when someone says, turn with me, and they read the scripture, you tend to zone out because you're waiting for the explanation of the scripture. You're like, okay, when he's done reading the scripture, he'll explain it to us. So you kind of zone out. I'm going to ask you not to zone out. Turn with me to Mark 4.13. We're going to go through verse 20. Mark 14, verse 13. Mark 4.13 through verse 20. I want your eyes, either in your Bible, on your phone, on your iPad, or on the screen, to rest on these words. Mark 4, verse 13 through 20. There it goes. He said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand the rest of the parables? In verse 14 it says, The sower sows the word. These are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown, they hear it, and Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Notice where the word was sown, in their hearts, not only in their heads. That means it got in. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground. When they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, so they endure only for a time. And afterward, the, then when the tribulation and persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. It says, now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in, choke off the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. I was considering having some people come up and help me illustrate this. I think I was, a lot of people left, so I figured we're going to have to use the whole people, all the people to do it. Let me start with the youth. Come on up here. There are four factors. Come on up. Okay, good. That's good. I should have enough with these. There's four factors here we're looking at. We have the sower, which is the preacher. Who wants to be the preacher? Rex, you look like a preacher. Go stand over there. <laughs> then the next thing we have is the seed, which is the Word of God. The seed is never, ever the problem. You understand what I'm saying? The seed is never... If we're looking to find out where the problem with the gap is and why we're being unfruitful in an area, any area of our life, the seed is never the problem. The sower might have a little bit of a problem, but as long as he's sowing the seed, he shouldn't have a problem. Preachers have problems when they sow their opinion. So there could be a problem here. That's an area where we have to check. But the seed is never 
the problem. It always produces after its kind. You sow seeds of scriptures of healing, it will produce healing. The seed is never the problem. Okay, we got that. Then you have the, 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 the ground, the soil. So we'll start with Deanna. You stay right here. And, and you go with Deanna. So we have these two people who represent, turn around and face the sower. He's sowing the seed. They're the one who hears the word and it was sown in their heart. I always thought that when it was sown that they didn't really hear it. But it, it was, it made it to their heart. But, but they didn't value it. So say, oh, we, we've got, you got a red shirt on. I, I don't want to pick on you, but you know, that looks, you put the hood on you, the devil. Okay, there you go. <laughs> you, don't, you, you don't have to put the, the, the hood on and I'm not calling you the devil. It's just for an illustration. So basically, he comes as the sower sowing the seed. And go ahead, come over here and just snatch the word from him. You're going to take it right out. That's it. They, you're taking it from these people. They're the ones, that's it. So he steals the seed. There's no seed left. That means if there's no seed, if it was snatched, if there's no seed in the, seed in the ground, what's going to grow? Not a thing. Okay, so we get that, that, you two are the next group of people. The next one is the stony ground. They receive it with gladness. They receive it with gladness. <laughs> Yay, I'm happy. I received it. I need, I need some actors up here. Go ahead, you can ad lib a little bit. It helps here. It says they only endure for a short time because there was no root. In other words, the seed was sown, the flower grew, but it died. Now, I always thought that the reason, because it says when persecution came, they stumbled. I always thought it was the persecution that caused this weed to die. It wasn't. It was already dead when the persecution came, and there was nothing there to fight the persecution. There was, no, there was no root, and it died. So when the persecution came, what's the persecution? Well, if you don't have a good handle on what salvation is when you first come to church, they tell you you can be born again, you can go to heaven when you die. And you receive it with gladness, I'm going to heaven. But you don't really understand what happened, and you walk down the street and someone says, you're one of those born agains, like you got a disease? If you have no root, that persecution causes you to back off. There's nothing to fight that persecution with. When you learn about healing and prosperity, and you go down and say, yeah, God wants to bless us, and it goes, oh, you're one of those name it, claim it? You're with those who preach the prosperity gospel? Again, like you got a disease or there's something wrong with you. And if you don't know what the word says, there's no root, you have nothing to come back with. So it's important that you value the word. The third one are the ones who hear. They actually grow. They can't come in, the devil can't come in and say the word doesn't really mean that because they know that. What does it say that stops this? I, I'm, I'm seeing a picture of, a, of something that grew up, but like the fig tree, there's no fruit on it. There's something there, but there's no fruit. It's not dead. It's just not bearing fruit. So when there's a, a need for health or, or finances, you know what the Word says, you know what you should be doing, but the cares of life, these people right here, the, come on, Satan, the cares of life. What are the cares of life? You got to go shopping. You got to pick up bills. You got to pick up the kids. You got to wash the car. You got to do the dishes. You got to mow the lawn. You got to go to work. I mean, got to go to church. You know, sometimes the cares aren't bad things. I got to do ministry. I got to prepare my sermon. I mean, I'm just saying these things and you just start feeling, oh. <laughs> so what it does, it doesn't kill the seed. It just stops it from bearing fruit. And what's the fruit it's supposed to bear? Health. What you say, I sent my word to heal you. If the word is not producing healing, this is an area where most Christians are going to have to check. They're going to have to check why is the word being choked so it's not bearing fruit. It's not killing my plant. I'm still a living plant, but I'm not bearing fruit. Go ahead, you guys could sit down. There's one more group of people. It's the good ground. 
It says, these are the ones. Say, I'm one of the ones. I'm one of the ones. They accept the word. What they did is they didn't allow the devil to snatch the seed. That's how you keep your soil good. You value the word. Like I said, you're either hearing some, something for the first time and the seed is being planted. Actually, Jacqueline said it, but I repeated it. Or it's being watered. And you value the process. You understand the process. That's why some people got in late last night and said, oh, I'm just going to take the day off. Don't value the process of the seed. What I'm sharing today might change their life forever and they're missing it. Listen, when I did youth group, we'd come in 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and I would get yelled at by the pastor. But I told those kids, the only way I'm taking you is if not one of you miss church tomorrow, you wake yourself up, put water in your face, I don't care, drink, I don't care what you have to do, but I want you sitting on the front row and excited with eyes wide open. If you can't do that, we can't go. And they did it. You know, you have to discipline your flesh. If your flesh says, well, I want to go out tonight, and you go, then pay the price tomorrow. Amen. Yeah. Sleep after work on Monday. Do what you, but do not let the word be the thing that lacks. Do not let gathering yourself together is the thing you put aside because of a wedding or anything else. Amen. I come in late a lot. How many people got in real late last night? Anybody here? <laughs> and, and you made it. Congratulations. You're giving God something to work with. There's probably people in your office that came in late too. You didn't back down when persecution came. You, 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 you notice what it says. It doesn't say that those that had good ground didn't experience the cares of life. It doesn't say that just because the seed was sown that you're not going to have any more problems, which we get accused of saying as faith preachers. I'm telling you, if you know the truth about healing, you will probably experience more of the attacks of the enemy than the guy who doesn't. The cares of life are going to try to get on you more than the other guy. Let me ask you a question. If you're playing football, everybody in here has a general concept of what football is. Take the ball and run it from this side across the other end zone, right? I mean, that's all I'm asking. I'm not asking you. You have the general concept. Yeah, the downs and the flags. Who are you going to cover? The guy with a broken leg? All right, if he gets the ball, he's got a broken leg. I don't have to cover him at all. If he gets the ball and he starts running, I have all year to catch him. <laughs> or am I going to cover, put three of my best guys on the one guy who's the fastest on their team, and if he starts running, nobody will catch him. We've got to stop him before he gets started. You know, the, that is the scheme of our, our enemy. Let's stop him before they get started. Let's, let's double team and triple team the ones who could do most damage to us. So I said that in light of the cares of this world coming to those who are most threat to him. I'm not saying if you walk by faith, you're going to walk through life on a flowery bed of ease. Which is the lie that the devil says to stop people from listening to people like me. Well, they think they'll never have problems because they're in faith. People never hear what I have to say and will not come to my church because a radio preacher accused me of saying that you'll never have problems in life if you live by faith. And I never said it. But because they didn't hear for themselves, and they believe somebody else, they won't come to a church that preaches faith. Those name it, claim it people. Most of the people that are attacking Joel Osteen are attacking him because they never listen to him personally. Because if you do, I would love for you to listen to one of his sermons and take his sermon and bring it to me and say, this is what I disagree with. It's a great challenge. You may find some. But chances are you're not going to find what they're accusing him of. You know where all that lie came from? When he was on Oprah and they asked him, are homosexuals going to hell? And his answer was, I'm not their judge. From that statement, which I would say the same thing, because if you ask me, are liars going to heaven, or cheaters going to heaven, or drug addicts going to heaven, I have the same answer. I'm not their judge. I'm not here to judge people. I'm here to preach truth. And because he wouldn't condemn them to eternal hell, like it was his job to do, 
They said he's soft. He preaches vanilla ice cream. He preaches a feel-good gospel. As opposed to, I'm going to tell you you're going to hell and preach a horrible gospel and tell you you're supposed to be miserable. What's the other alternative? So we don't, you know, then I think of scriptures where the Bible says, touch not my anointed. These people, I'm listening to, at most, at best, first of all, before they judge the issue, they need to hear it themselves. At best, they should be praying for him. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sin, not expose it. And if someone's preaching something in error, I don't see people attacking Baptist people for not speaking in tongues. They kind of attack us a little bit for speaking in tongues, but you know, for the most part, there's something there that the devil doesn't like. That's why he's getting so much. He's, he's, he's the runner that if you follow him, he'll create a, a hole for you through the line where you could score touchdowns. You realize there's people that have left this church because I've defended a Joel Osteen? That's hilarious. I'm not going to talk about them, though. Just letting you aware. You know, I, I, I'm, I met Joel Osteen personally. I sat down and had a conversation with him. I didn't just get my photo op at a, at a, at a stand. I, I had a conversation with him about softball and baseball. And He's a great guy. He's not an evil guy. He's a funny guy. He's, we, we were laughing. He's, he's one of us. It would be like if all of a sudden one of you wound up on, teacher, on, on TV preaching to a million people. He's one of us. If you remember, he didn't want to do this. He was the one behind the camera. Didn't want to do this. And God said, you're the one. He's like, oh, no, I'm not. And then he had to go to his father on his deathbed. Shh. He said, Dad, I, I know God called me to do it. And he took what his father did, which was a, a, a successful by any means of church growth, and look what it grew into. You know what? Those crowds represent people are going to heaven. You want to fight that? Oh my goodness. Let's, let's, let, let's move on, because I could stay there camp for a long time. So the word, when we bear fruit, is supposed to change our life. It's supposed to, bring, supposed to bring healing and health and set people free. And, 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 and to the degree that you do the things of not letting the seed be sown is to the degree that determines how good your ground is that will produce a crop. The Word of God is supposed to bring instruction, rebuke, rebuke correction, encouragement, peace, light, hope. That's what's at stake when you don't value the Word. And, and water it, and nourish it, and, and, and pluck the weeds, and that's your job. We mentioned some of the, pers the, the, the things that cause the seed to die, the cares of life, and they're not always bad things. Could be good things that's causing you to neglect the word. Without water, a plant dies. You hear the word preached, without watering it, it will die. You know what the, de the devil's job is to cause you, in, in the marriage class, in love and respect, they talk about the crazy cycle in a, in a, in a marriage. Well, he withholds respect, so I'm going to withhold love. She withholds respect, so he withhold, withholds love. And the very thing they need is going in the wrong direction. When one person says, well, he don't deserve my respect, but I'm going to respect him anyway, and that respect causes, well, she respects me, so I'm going to love her, even though she doesn't deserve to be loved. And then the cycle gets reversed and starts going in a positive direction. What we're seeing here, the crazy cycle spiritually, is the devil keeps you from the word, you get discouraged. So you don't go to the thing that's supposed to encourage you, so you, do, you back off even further and have less word, it's more discouragement, and you get in the crazy cycle going backwards. And if he can't get you tripped up with sin, he'll get you tripped up with good works. Make no mistake about it. He does not want you to bear fruit. My goodness. Do I have time to finish this? Yeah, you, don't, you don't see my nose before you say yeah. You know what? I'm going to start this next point, And then we will continue another time. And I'll be quick with this one. The third thing we got to look at in our life, if we're not bearing fruit, and, and the thing that 
may be the cause of this gap is the lack of obedience. Not being a doer of the word. You hear the word all the time. Um, when you first hear the word, there's things that you hear that's easy to change. You change them quickly. Then there's other things that are kind of the middle of the ground. You hear them preached and you're like, wow, that's a little uncomfortable. But throughout some more study and through prayer and through some determination, you get the victory with God. But then there's these other areas that people, it's the hard ones. That if you don't stay on top of, they will never change. And, and people have looked to give themselves a pardon. Because I've done so well in all these areas. Or they'll say things like, well, it's my only vice. Or when it comes to personality things, the way they say things to people, they're like, well, they know how I am. And they look to excuse the areas in their life that really need to be changed. Especially in the area when it comes to people skills and relating with others. You know, I was talking to my wife this morning about the DISC profile we do. Everybody is separated into four classes of personality types. And I, and I, and I started out by saying all the negative things about all the personality types. And, and, and her response was, well, pointing out people's negatives doesn't help them. I said, yeah, it does. Let me explain why. If you start out with the D, I thought they're domineering. They want to control. And they, I said, so if, if I'm another personality, I have to realize they are wired that way and I'm not going to take it personally. And if you are a D, you need to realize I'm wired that way. I've got to watch myself. The I, probably the word that would describe eyes in many cases would be irresponsible. Now, I'm an I. I have to take it. If the shoe fits, wear it. So what does that mean? That means I got to work on being responsible. And that means when people are working with me, they need to realize that the reason you are because you are, the way you are is because you're wired that way. I'm wired that way. I am wired to do things last minute. It's the way I'm wired. It's taken me a long time to change that. So when you're dealing with me, <laughs> you're laughing, it's funny, it's not funny. I've been working on this, and I've gotten a lot better. But if you're here, and you are a C personality, which I can put the word that their, their shortcoming is controlling. There's a one way to do it, can't you see it? That's the only way to do it. And if you don't plan this thing a year and a half before it happens, you're not doing it right. And the C says, yeah, what's wrong with that? <laughs> of course. But what does that mean? The C personality needs to realize that I'm not being, waiting to the last minute just to annoy them. <laughs> That's not why I'm doing it. It's a blind side in my life. They need to realize that's why you're here. And you have to realize that it may take you a little bit and you may have to be frustrated and, and, and the change in my life may come so, but the eyes need to realize, you know, let's not sweat the small things, you know. It, let, let's, let's, okay, let's, so we all balance each other. And the S's, what can you say about the S's? I, I guess, I don't know of a word that's a, what do they call that, a synonym, you know, for, for being offended easily. What's an S word that says? Sensitive. Thank you. They get their feelings hurt real easy. And I don't know why, which one of my personality types gets frustrated with that. It's like, really? <laughs> you know, come on. You, you know, so I have to be careful when I'm around an S. They want harmony. They want everybody to be happy. Sometimes, you know, I'll say something if somebody doesn't like it. I'm like, it's true anyway. <laughs> and my wife's like, ugh. Sometimes when I'm preaching and I see my wife cringe, I go, oh boy, what did I just say? <laughs> That's why she's here, to help me. It's interesting. She seems to do that a whole lot more this way than I do that way. Although I've seen her be pretty irresponsible at times, planning things at the last minute. So come on, we went on vacation this summer. 
We didn't know where we were going while we were driving. But she was okay with it. Yeah, listen, that's not the woman I married 30 years ago, 27 years ago, whatever it is. She would have been like, she couldn't have enjoyed herself. She would have been like, wait a minute, we don't, she's, she's got a strong C personality. We were heading to North Carolina, but we hadn't booked a place. And let me tell you, sometimes my irresponsibility is actually the Lord. So you've got to be careful. Because if we would have went to North Carolina, and I didn't feel right about booking all the places, what about this place? She wants to order things. What about this place? Come on, we've got to make a decision. What about this place? Don't feel right about it. There was one we almost booked, and, and she called back and did a little research and found out it was a scam. So you've got to make sure the PC personality that wants to do things on time don't run through those kind of roadblocks. And then we find out while we're driving that they had some kind of green tide or something and you couldn't go in the water in North Carolina. Good thing we didn't book anything. Can I say the Lord was leading me that way? Not intentionally. <laughs> I can't say I heard from the Lord, but you know, you, you just got to allow for that. And we wound up booking a place in Florida and we had a great time. So again, the personalities have to work together. So... <laughs> Boy, where did I get on that one? That was a long one. So, so we're talking about the lack of obedience. Working on the areas. That's where I was. Working on the areas that don't quite come so easy for you. If you realize you're the type of friend, person that offends a lot of people, and it's not just one person saying you offended me, or usually they don't come to you. You keep hearing from other people that you, this one was offended, that was, you have to say, okay, I have to work on something. For me to be a pastor, we're talking about working on things that are hard for you. I, I ran into a girl the other day. I was taking my dad to the doctor's office. She was sitting next to me. She goes, you're Pastor Yoris, aren't you? I said, uh-oh. She said, I said, yeah. She goes, you were from Calvary, right? She goes, I met you there. We went to high school together. You, you were in my class. She said, when I saw you at church, she said, I couldn't believe it. She said, you were the class clown. And the, for you to take anything serious, I can't believe it. So, so that was my personality. And I'm thinking, I guess, I thought I was just kind of flying under the radar, having fun. But I guess that was the reputation I have. In that particular class, she reminded me it was Miss May. I never sat in my chair. I always sat on my desk. Never had a book, never had a pencil. She would say something and I would have a wisecrack and the whole class would laugh. And you would think, well, why didn't she discipline you? I don't know why. There's grace on my life. I have favor. I don't know why these people let me get away with these things. On, on, on Parents' Day, she told my mother, she goes, I don't, I've never experienced this before, ever in my life as a teacher. And she had been a teacher for a while. She goes, your son disrupts my class. And I let him. She said, I love that kid. I love having him around. He's the most helpful. But I can't teach anything who's here when he's here. <laughs> I had my history teacher. I'm just telling you my personality. My history teacher, I was always late. <laughs> Who's surprised? Because history was right after lunch, and I used to go home for lunch. And I'd always be late, and it was November-ish, because I had a hat and coat on. And I walked in the glass with my coat on, and because and it took him a little while to realize this. He didn't get it the first day. He said, oh, you have your hat and coat on. You're, you look like you're ready to leave. I said, I'd leave, but I can't feel this class. He said, I'll give you 85 if you never come back. <laughs> Deal. Now I had two lunch periods. <laughs> I'm, youth, close your ears. So I saw a gift in my life operating even back then. I worked for one of the teachers. And if I failed the test, as I was working with you when I took the test, even if I wasn't, he'd go talk to the teacher and I got an 85 on a test I never took. So now for me to be a pastor, I drew a picture for a reason. For me to be a pastor, things got to change around here. 
And that change didn't come easy in my life. Pastor John introduced me once to a guest speaker. This is Pastor Jack. He's my assistant pastor. And God put him here so we don't take ourselves too seriously. That was the introduction. I told you I'd be sitting, you know, we'd have a party and people walk by, had a rubber band, snapped everybody in the back of the leg as they, ah, they walked by. There was about a lady, she's about 85 years old. Just, please don't die, please don't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to you, promise. Go ahead, free pass. These are the things, and you know how God dealt with me as a pastor? No, nobody wants the class clown to be their pastor. You want to talk about a sharp wit. You want to talk about things that just... You see the analogies I use when I'm preaching? Those things came out if I wanted to do coarse jesting. They come as rapidly as do illustrations for sermons. When I played baseball, one of my friends, he was in his 20s, had balled right down the middle. And every game I had something to say. One game I picked up a big chunk of grass. You know when you pick it up from the root and there's, there's the, you got the dirt? And I literally put it on my head, dirt and all, and say, this might grow. One day I had a pom-pom and I did it. Every, they, they just came to me real quick. And then when I got saved, God said, that might be a sensitive area in his life. It's like, ooh. Then I realized, of course, jesting is not good because you don't know what's sensitive in somebody's area. You may think you're being funny, but you don't know when you're sticking a dagger in somebody's heart. You, you're joking with a girl about something and you don't realize that when she was younger, she was molested by her father and everything. And that joke struck, home, struck a nerve and hurt her. So I had a shoo. God told me, if you're going to be a pastor... You have to be professional. I thought if I went in for a job interview to make a lot of money and I wore a suit, I wouldn't be, hey, dude, you know, hey, you know, just coarse jesting and making jokes when I'm trying. So for me to be a pastor, I had to be professional. And it didn't come easy. And it was a slow process. I remember we were meeting at the hotel and the hallways were big and wide and the kids are throwing the football. I'm sitting there going, I'm going to play. You know how many times my wife has held me? Stop it, you're the pastor. I remember Mike Franco had a party at his house. I got there before him because he was out getting something, or I got there while he wasn't there. And I walked up and said, hey, Miss Franco, so good to see you. I'm Jack, and you know, thank you for having us. And then I went out and played with the kids. We were throwing the ball in the pool and diving and playing football and doing, I mean, just I was having a ball. At the end of the night, we were all sitting down. It was... About 10 of us left, and Mrs. Franco's sitting there. I'm sitting right next to us, and she says, Mike, I thought you said your pastor was coming. He's like, he's right there. And by then, we'd been so buddy-buddy. She goes, not him. <laughs> no, that's, that's not the pastor. She goes, yeah, it is. She's going, there's no way he could be the pastor. Now, now and on one hand, there, there's something good about that. On one hand. But on the other hand... When your relative's dying of cancer, do you want to call that guy? It's a tough balance, what I'm walking through. Nobody wants to call the clown when you're in a crisis. I've changed, and when I got to the point, I said, God, did I, I changed. Look, he goes, you didn't even start. Just keep going. Yeah, and that's because you know me. Anybody who's taken the time, and, and this is again, we'll talk about the personality profile. Anybody who knows me knows and has learned that I could be having the most fun in the world, laughing and being light, but yet still have my ear out for what's going on and know what the devil's doing. And if the need comes, switch gears and rebuke a devil and be serious mode that quick. Amen. But the average person who comes in doesn't know that. So I need to take time. To, so when, when I'm down left with the people who've been here 10 or 15 years,